In the heart of Berlin, children play innocently over what was once Adolf Hitler's death tomb. It was here in the Führer bunker on April the 30th, 1945, that Hitler made the final preparations for his suicide. Outside, in a devastating final assault on the heart of the Third Reich, the Russian army closed in on the Führer. I stood next to the machinery room when I heard a shot. Then everything happened very quickly. I ran away out of fear, but I immediately came back down from the upper bunker. Just then, they were wrapping Hitler in blankets. Hitler's death brought to an end his dream of a thousand-year Reich. It lasted only 12 years, but changed the world. The Führer was defeated by the Allies and by a man, once his partner, then his nemesis, a man who shared many of the same characteristics, Josef Stalin. Stalin would continue his rule for eight more years until March the 5th, 1953, when he died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Different endings to lives that were remarkably similar, deprived childhoods, violent fathers, adoring mothers, problems with women, and paranoia. They were both mass murderers. Hitler was responsible for nearly 10 million deaths in the Holocaust, six million Jews, and hundreds of thousands of gypsies and homosexuals. Hitler was very compulsive, phobic, and paranoid, both in considering himself to be the object of persecution and attempts to kill him, and in the uh, positive sense of uh, believing that he had a sacred mission to save Germany and save the world. Stalin murdered more than 20 million of his own people, political opponents and innocent victims, who Stalin considered a threat. In an ordinary context, I think he would be judged mentally ill. I think he would be judged paranoid, although uh, I don't think he suffered from a full-blown paranoid schizophrenia. How do you measure and explain such monstrous evil? One approach is a controversial new field of research, psychohistory. I used all fields of social science that I could pull something from. Psychoanalysis, behaviorism, experimental psychology in general, social psychology, anthropology, sociology. Hitler is uh, often described as an enigma, and he is an enigma. In, in many ways. There's a school of thought that argues Hitler was so evil we can never really understand him. But that's not the psychohistorian's point of view. Uh, we think that uh, by the use of, of scientific psychology we can plumb the depths and grasp his deeper meanings, his significance. In examining their lives, we found surprising similarities, beginning with childhood. Stalin was born in the Georgian village of Gori on December the 21st, 1879, christened Josef Zugashvili. Three siblings had died before his birth. His deeply religious mother nicknamed him Soso and promised to dedicate his life to God. Josef's father was an abusive alcoholic who savagely beat his son, one time so severely that the boy had blood in his urine. His father was a drunken shoemaker who beat his mother, and Stalin got beaten up as a little child by trying to defend his mother. This had a lasting impression on him. Ever since childhood, he felt unworthy. As a result of these early childhood experiences, he had a low uh, self-esteem, what's typically called uh, inferiority complex. Yosef's physical characteristics didn't help. He never grew taller than five feet four inches, and his face was pockmarked from smallpox. His body was slightly deformed, the left arm shorter than the right, and rigid from a childhood accident. 
Hitler was also unhappy with his looks. A colleague noted his low, retreating forehead, ugly nose, broad cheekbones, small eyes. Hitler didn't like his plump nose, which he considered Jewish. Both Hitler and Stalin suffered from inferiority complexes. Even as a boy, Josef was quick to anger and harbored grudges. Josef's mother, Yekaterina, enrolled young Soso in the church choir, hoping he would become a priest. In 1894, at the age of 15, Josef entered the Tiflis Theological Seminary and began a life of rigid routine. Josef's intelligence, prodigious memory, and talent for details impressed the teachers, but they also witnessed a stubborn, violent side. Finding the seminary life oppressive, Yosef turned away from religion and became attracted to 19th century anarchists, revolutionary terrorism, and Marxism. After five years in the seminary, he was expelled for his revolutionary activities. He might be described as a warfare personality. Uh, his whole life consisted in struggle against those whom he put down in his mind as enemies. He had what we might call an enemy complex. Ten years after Josef's birth, on April the 20th, 1889, Adolf was born, also in a rural area, in Braunau, a small desolate town in Austria. His mother, Clara, was married to a moderately successful civil servant, Alois Schickelgruber, 23 years her senior. She was 18 years old when she gave birth to Adolf. Alois Schickelgruber, who later changed his name to Hitler, was a rigid, cold, strict disciplinarian who regularly beat young Adolf. When he was 10, Hitler decided to run away from home because of the beatings. His father caught him and gave him such a beating that he was in a coma for days, his life hanging by a thread. And that kind of experience instills the belief that one is evil terribly evil, and later on, he used uh, the German phrase, Lebensunwürdige Leben, meaning living things that are unworthy to live. He classified large segments of the German nation as unworthy to live. And the idea, I believe, came from his own sense of himself. When he was a boy, Adolf also wanted to be a priest, and like Stalin, sang in the church choir. Hitler's father was the illegitimate son of an unmarried 42-year-old peasant woman who became pregnant while working as a domestic for a Jewish family. She never revealed who the father was. Hitler was obsessed with the thought that his paternal grandfather might have been Jewish. What is important is what Hitler thought, and what he thought is established, that his grandfather was a Jew, so the offspring of a Jewish and, and Christian mating would always be a Jew. That was the basis for his belief that he was diseased, that nothing could remove this from him because it was in his blood. In 1900, Hitler enrolled in elementary school in Linz. Like Stalin, the young Adolf was considered egotistical and domineering, demanding absolute subordination from other students. At the same time, he was a poor student, much more interested in becoming an artist against his father's wishes. By 1905, he dropped out of school to pursue a career in art. Like Hitler, Josef had an artistic side. As a teenager, he started writing poetry, at first romantic, and then turning increasingly nihilistic and violent. By 1900, when he was 21, Josef Jugashvili had turned from a life of religion to a life of violence. For the next 15 years, he lived the life of an active revolutionary 
robbing banks and confiscating payrolls at gunpoint to raise money to overthrow the Tsar. In 1910, Yosef chose a new name, Stalin, which in Russian means man of steel. During this period, Stalin was arrested eight times by Tsarist police and each time deported to remote rural areas in Siberia. He was always a loner, a very bitter and unpleasant person. You find this in memoirs of other revolutionaries who shared exile with him, that he never took part in their social activities. He was always apart and bitter and, and nasty. Stalin soon caught Lenin's eye as an effective and ruthless revolutionary. During the Russian Revolution in October 1917, Stalin wasn't a major figure, but he was ambitious and determined to rise to the top of the Communist Party. Stalin had defined himself as a revolutionary and knew exactly what he wanted in life. But Hitler was still searching for himself, and in 1907, moved to Vienna to pursue a career in art. In Vienna, Adolf rented a tiny bug-infested room here on 29 Stumpergasse. Living on a small inheritance controlled by his mother, he pursued his dream of entering the Academy of Fine Arts. But his dream was shattered when his mother, Clara, died after a long and painful struggle with breast cancer. Because of the extreme closeness between Hitler and his mother, he became non-functional. He was devastated by her death. After his mother's death, to support himself, Adolf sold his paintings on the street. It is interesting that he only painted landscapes never people. Two years in a row, Hitler applied to and was rejected by the prestigious Academy of Fine Arts. Because he was unable to draw humans, the Academy told him that he had no aptitude for painting. He decided he was rejected because several of the admissions committee were Jewish. Vienna was his first exposure to Jews from Eastern Europe. Hitler became attracted to the rhetoric in racist, anti-Semitic newspapers and pamphlets. It was during this period that he first became intrigued by the idea of a pure German master race. After his rejection by the Academy and the death of his mother, Hitler was miserable in Vienna, lonely and poor, lacking direction, Finally, in 1914, with the outbreak of World War I, Hitler enlisted in the army and found his identity in battle, carnage and death. For the first time in his life, Hitler was happy, felt at home, that he belonged. In his army service, Hitler was the happiest he was at any time in his life. The sanctioned killing that he was entitled to engage in as a soldier gave an outlet for the first time to the murderous rage that had uh, grown in him from treatment by his father. Hitler served as a courier and experienced his first real success in life when he was awarded the Iron Cross first class, rare for a corporal. Hitler's experience in World War I, the fact that he survived 50 battles in which his own regiment was wiped out over and over, replenished and replenished and wiped out again and again. Confirmed his belief that he was chosen by destiny for a magnificent role in history. When Germany signed the armistice on November the 11th in 1918, Hitler was enraged. He pledged to avenge those who betrayed the fatherland, in his view, the communists and the Jews. The year 1924 was pivotal for Stalin, 
Fade intervened and gave him an opportunity to seize power. In 1924, Lenin had suffered a series of strokes. Knowing his death was imminent, Lenin warned the party to beware of Stalin. Lenin saw that something was wrong with this man. He saw that he was a problematic personality and that he was a dangerous person to achieve high office and especially the very high top office that he, Lenin, had held as the recognized supreme leader of the Bolshevik party and therefore of the Soviet state. But it was too late. Lenin died and Stalin immediately began jockeying for power. Driven by ambition, he outmaneuvered and intimidated potential rivals, using ruthless agents to do his dirty work. The system of agents around him who were constantly eliminating any potential uh, political opponents was itself paranoid. Uh, the, the, the core, the, the, the center of the paranoia was Stalin himself, but he managed to recruit people who thought like him, people who saw enemies everywhere. Stalin once said, to choose one's enemy, to prepare every detail of the blow, to slake an implacable vengeance, and then go to bed, there is nothing sweeter in the world. The symptoms of paranoia appeared relatively early, not only during his dictatorship, but even before. Um, the famous neurologist uh, Vladimir Becher actually examined Stalin in 1927 and diagnosed him as paranoid. A few hours later, Bechterev died in mysterious circumstances. I should emphasize that this was not amateur psychohistory. This was a professional diagnosis. The same cruelty and sadism of Stalin's political life dominated his family life, especially his relations with his second wife, Nadia. His relation to this particular woman was terrible. He abused her, both psychologically and physically. Nadia was much younger, 17, when he was 40. She bore him two children, a son, Vasily, and a daughter, Svetlana. Stalin had another son, Yakov, from his first wife, Yekaterina, who died of typhoid in 1907, the same year that Hitler's mother died. He also humiliated and insulted his sons. Vasily became an alcoholic, and Yakov once tried to commit suicide. His abuse as a child was transmitted in the form of his abuse to his own children. Nadia was a good mother, both to her own children and to her stepson, Yakov. She was a member of a uh, old Bolshevik family in Leningrad. And for him, he was one of the leaders of the revolution. And she looked up to him and had great belief in him. But Stalin was notoriously cruel to Nadia, insulting her in front of other people. Little by little, she became aware of his personal defects his defects of character, which were shown in many ways at home. On November the 8th, 1932, Nadia and Stalin had a violent argument at a party in Moscow. He became furious and half drunk, threw cigarette butts in her face. She got up and left, returning to their Kremlin apartment. The next morning, Nadia was found dead, shot in the heart. He either drove her to suicide or killed her himself. Uh, historians have not been able to agree on exactly uh, what happened, uh, but hers was not a natural death. According to Svetlana, her mother, Nadia, left Stalin a letter which was full of personal and political reproaches, and that he was, went into a rage as a result of this letter. And uh, when they, uh, the funeral came about, he walked up to her coffin and then pushed it away. He never went to her grave at the Novodemichi Cemetery. Hitler's relationships with women were equally troubled. While he both revered and idealized women, 
he also treated them with contempt and degraded them. Because of his extreme closeness to his mother, together with his father's extreme brutality, he grew up with what is typical in the circumstances, an obsession with women and sex, together with extreme inhibition. After his mother, the most important woman in Hitler's life was his younger niece, Geli Raubau, who lived with Hitler in his Munich apartment. He idolized and worshipped her, but was extremely jealous of her relations with other men. In general, Hitler treated Geli as he treated most people he knew, in an overbearing, controlling, authoritarian way. Geli, however, was a very spirited person who regularly stood up to him. He was never able to exert the uh, degree of control over her that he wished to. While Geli was living with Hitler in Munich, she continued a relationship with a man in Vienna and became pregnant by him. This was bad enough to Hitler, but what upset him most was that he was Jewish. They had a terrible fight that was overheard by the servants in the apartment, although they didn't know the content of it. And Hitler uh, drove off to fulfill a speaking engagement out of town. The next morning, Gailey was found dead in Hitler's Munich apartment, victim of a gunshot wound to the chest. Gailey Raubal's death in 1931 remains a mystery, but there is no doubt that Hitler contributed to her tragic end. At the time of Gailey Raubal's suicide, Hitler had also been seeing another woman, Eva Braun. They met when Eva worked in the studio of Hitler's official photographer, Heinrich Hoffmann. This is how Adolf Hitler first appeared to the 18-year-old Eva, working in Heinrich Hoffmann's darkroom. Eva became an ardent admirer of Hitler's charisma and was fascinated with Hoffmann's photographs. Eva Braun quickly fell in love with Hitler. She wanted to marry him. She wanted to have children with him. He was dead against both of those things. Hitler considered Eva the ideal German woman. In his words, cute, cuddly, and naive. But he never took her out publicly. Eva felt lonely and neglected and complained about it in her diary. The weather is so wonderful, and I, the mistress of the greatest man in Germany and in the world, am sitting here and gazing at the sun through a window. How can he have so little understanding as to let me remain here, bowing to strangers? I've just sent him the crucial letter. Question, will he attach any importance to it? We'll see. If I don't get an answer before this evening, I'll take 25 pills and gently fall asleep into another world. He has so often told me he is madly in love with me, but what does that mean when I haven't had a good word from him in three months? She attempted suicide a couple of times out of despair and one time he asked the doctor who came in after she tried to kill herself whether this was a genuine suicide attempt or only a trick to win his sympathy. The physician assured Hitler that it was a genuine attempt and he was touched by that. Hitler kept his distance from Eva and never displayed any affection toward her or any woman for that matter. He had said over and over again, I am married to Germany. On January the 30th, 1933, Hitler became Chancellor of Germany and launched the brutal dictatorship that reflected his narcissism and paranoia. He immediately created a police state and used his dreaded secret police, the SS and Gestapo, to enforce it. 
To strengthen his grip on the Nazi party, Hitler eliminated his political rivals and so-called enemies of the state. Whoever knew how to read, and whoever had read Mein Kampf, should have known where it would lead. National Socialism excluded all those who thought differently, locked them up, exploited them, and even murdered them in masses, simply because they did not want to succumb to the system. Einfach weil sie nicht dem System sich unterwerfen wollten. Hitler's ruthlessness in liquidating his rivals inspired Stalin. Despite the blind worship of the masses, and his total control of every aspect of Soviet society, Stalin was morbidly suspicious and saw enemies everywhere. He even turned on old friends. There was a very popular party boss in Leningrad, Sergei Kirov. And many of them who thought that Stalin's time had gone, that he should be removed from the secretary general role, thought that Kirov should be his successor. Sergei Kirov remained loyal to Stalin, and in 1934, at the 17th Party Congress, lavishly praised Stalin. Stalin loved Kirov and knew he was loyal, but he had become too popular for Stalin's liking. On December 1, 1934, in Leningrad, Kirov was assassinated. And from all that we know now, it seems beyond serious doubt that Stalin was responsible for this crime. And the murder of Kirov was ascribed to Stalin's enemies in the party uh, and to all of those in the factions who had opposed him and who might be suspected of opposing him. So that this murder of Kirov was the beginning of the great terror. Stalin attended Kirov's funeral and feigned grief at his coffin, a master of duplicity. Kirov was the first one who was killed, and then it went into the general purges. Then anybody immediately, anyone who had had any contacts with the opposition, these were rounded up within days and were in jail, and some of them were shot immediately, and the purges just rolled on from there to the point where they were shooting 1,500 to 2,000 people in Moscow alone in one day in, in the summer of 1937. During these purges, it's estimated that Stalin liquidated 20 million Soviet citizens as enemies of the people. <laughs> Members of his own governing group, the Politburo, were so afraid of him that no one dared to be the first to stop clapping for Stalin. The clapping would go on for so long that finally, bells were used to call for an end to the applause. Stalin eliminated enemies, or imagined enemies, both literally and figuratively. Take, for example, Trotsky. Uh, there is the famous photograph of Lenin giving a speech, Trotsky standing over on the other side of the platform. Later on, uh, Trotsky disappears. Stalin arranged for Trotsky to disappear both in that photograph and later on in real life when he had him assassinated. Anyone liquidated by Stalin's regime was, on his orders, removed from historical records forever and their photos destroyed. Not even posters were exempt. The finest of artists in the Soviet Union spent long hours retouching photos, erasing images of those who had vanished. The, the, the photographs and the retouching of the photographs just demonstrates a sort of like a, a, a second death. For 30 years, photo historian David King has assembled the world's largest collection of photographs, posters, and paintings from the Soviet era and documented Stalin's perfidy. What you're really seeing is a second death. The first death at the hands of the secret police and uh, the second death is a death concerned with elimination from 
the media, this second death was just as uh, powerful and final as the first because uh, normally one has remembrance of, of people who have died and with this it was the idea was to eliminate that they had ever ever existed in the first place. And the results of uh, retouching of these faces becomes very, very strange and macabre indeed. Not only were they um, splashed with India ink, but they were also hacked with uh, razors, scissors. The more aggressive the retouching, I think probably contributed to the fact that you would be considered to be a better Stalinist. Like Stalin, Hitler also revised history, and in Hitler's case, erased part of his own past. On March the 11th, 1938, enthusiastic crowds greeted the Führer as he annexed Austria and made it part of the Third Reich. But Hitler had another very personal agenda. Once Austria belonged to Hitler, he took steps to eradicate any suspicion of his Jewish past. One thing Hitler, uh, from the very beginning, sought to do was to cover up the evidence of his past. And so, by doing so, he caused a lot of rumors and uh, myths to be projected upon uh, the, the blank space of the past that he, had, he tried to erase. Like Stalin erasing photographs, Hitler eradicated the Austrian village of Dollersheim and a dark secret that had haunted him for years. The birth registry of Dollersheim held the birth certificate of his father, who Hitler suspected was the illegitimate son of a Jew. Hitler used the village as an artillery range. Round after round of artillery fire crashed into the village, demolishing its buildings and making the graves in the cemetery unrecognizable. You come upon this sort of ruined church with just some hollow walls standing, and it seemed to me in some way a metaphor for the ruin of uh, the absence, the vacancy of the historical record on Hitler's past. By obliterating the town, Hitler erased suspicion of his own Jewish blood. Like Stalin, Hitler believed he was surrounded by enemies trying to betray him and that he needed to strike first. Hitler grew up with the idea from his experience in his own family that it was probably necessary to kill if one did not want to be killed. He generalized this and divided people into predators and victims and chose very deliberately to be a predator. The predators' next victims would be Jews. Hitler's obsession and secret plan would be to liquidate all the Jews of Germany, Europe and the Soviet Union under the cover of war. Hitler's secret agenda had always been to attack Russia. Now he was ready. To lull Stalin to sleep and give him a false sense of security, Hitler signed a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union in June 1939. The two most powerful dictators in the world became allies. Stalin, ironically, felt secure. On the morning of June the 22nd, 1941, Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of Russia. For Hitler, it would fulfill two goals, the destruction of Bolshevism and the annihilation of the Jews. The invasion stunned Stalin, and not surprisingly, he felt personally betrayed. It was a total surprise to Stalin, and he was very disoriented as a result, and for the next several weeks, he went into a kind of uh, nervous breakdown and people had difficulty contacting him, uh, getting him to understand what was happening. And it wasn't for about three or four weeks that he finally pulled himself together and started acting 
like the man he was supposed to be. For the paper today, all are eager to read the speech of Stalin. Stalin calls upon the Soviet people to grapple in deadly conflict with its most vicious, most treacherous enemy. In late 1941, Operation Barbarossa appeared to be a smashing success. Hitler was jubilant. But Providence did not favor the Fuhrer. And ironically, the beginning of the end came 15 months later in a city called Stalingrad. Here, the symbolic showdown between two men of iron came to a head. In September 1942, the Germans launched an all-out land and air attack on Stalingrad. Stalin issued an order. Any soldier that surrendered would be considered a traitor. Retreating soldiers were shot. If they were commanding officers, the family members should be subject to repression. As it turned out, he himself had a family member who was an officer, and this was his son, Yakov. Stalin's son, Yakov, had joined the army and was taken prisoner by the Germans. At one point, the Germans may have thought they could offer to exchange Yakov for some uh, high-level German officers who had been taken prisoner by the Russians. And uh, some kind of a offer was made to which Stalin is believed to have said, I have no son named Yakov. The Russians held on and launched a massive counterattack of one million men encircling the German Sixth Army. In 1943, Hitler was defeated at Stalingrad and the German army would never recover on the Eastern Front. But even though Hitler was losing the war, he was still determined to exterminate the Jews. When things were hanging precariously in the balance on the Eastern Front, Hitler given the choice between allocating troops and trains to reinforce the German armies fighting off the assault of Stalin's Red Army and allocating those troops and trains to carrying Jews to the death camps, Hitler withdrew troops and trains from the Eastern Front uh, in order to more swiftly and efficiently carry out the murder of the Jews. By now, in 1943, Hitler was a very sick man. After his defeat at Stalingrad, Hitler became increasingly dependent on amphetamines. Each morning, his personal physician, Dr. Theodor Morel, gave him an injection. Throughout the day, Hitler treated himself with oral amphetamines. At night, he took barbiturates to sleep. As the war went on, the Fuhrer became more and more dependent on Dr. Morel. New information obtained from Hitler's medical records reveals that he showed signs of drug toxicity which affected his judgment. He became increasingly more paranoid. Towards the end of the war, Hitler began to show symptoms of Parkinson's disease. When man täglich mit zusammen ist, da fällt das nicht so auf. He trembled slightly, but if you are with someone every day, you don't notice this no one paid attention to every detail. As the Red Army overwhelmed Berlin, Hitler was hiding deep inside the Führer bunker beneath the Chancellery. When Russian soldiers entered the bunker, they found several Nazi corpses amidst signs of an orgy. In the courtyard were the charred bodies of Eva Braun and Hitler. Inside, on the Führer's desk, the Russians found a folder with 42 of Hitler's paintings of pastoral Austria and an album of prized snapshots. Inside, a photo Hitler had been carrying with him all his life of his mother, Clara. Stalin, the final victor, exploited his triumph over the Nazis by parading long lines of Nazi war prisoners through Red Square to rally the Soviet people. Many had hoped the Man of Steel had softened. 
I remember I, at the time, was an attache of the American Embassy. And on May 9, 1945, the day the surrender took place, there was a great burst of rejoicing on the streets of Moscow. People were dancing. And I remember standing in a group in which one young officer, perhaps a major, said in Russian, now it's time to live. But Stalin, as usual, needed enemies, not peace and freedom. The terror this time was directed against Jews. It centered on a group of Jewish doctors Stalin accused of plotting to murder Soviet leaders, including Stalin himself. The accused doctors were to be publicly executed on Red Square. And following that, the Jewish population of the major cities were to be deported to Eastern Siberia with the uh, pogroms perpetrated against him en route. Only his sudden death on March the 5th, 1953, of a cerebral hemorrhage prevented him from carrying out yet another purge. His daughter, Svetlana, recalled the scene as she stood by his deathbed. He suddenly opened his eyes and cast a glance over everyone in the room. It was a terrible glance. Then something incomprehensible and awesome happened. He suddenly lifted his left hand as though he were pointing to something above and bringing down a curse on all of us. The next moment, after a final effort, the spirit wrenched itself free of the flesh. Hundreds of thousands of mourners watched as Stalin was laid to rest in the mausoleum beside Lenin. For Adolf Hitler, there was no monument, not even a marker.